Good morning. Come on in, take a seat. It is good to have you here uh, together with us this morning. I hope you grabbed a bulletin uh, when you came in. Uh, let me just uh, direct your attention to a couple of announcements. I won't go over everything that's on the back here. That's why you have it printed and can take it uh, with you. And as always, there's more information um, and calendar on our website. But, um, but let me just note a couple of things in the uh, the schedule, things upcoming for the church. One, and there's a sign-up sheet for this on the table. Next Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together, the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, uh, which is our practice on the first uh, Sunday of the month. And in conjunction with that, we will have uh, a fellowship meal. After the service, go downstairs, uh, have a simple meal together to enjoy uh, getting to know one another a little bit better. Um, what we do is we have soup, we have bread, we have desserts. There's a sign-up sheet on the table. We are in particular need of soups uh, for next week. So it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be fancy, um, but if you're able to contribute something to that, uh, put your name on the list before you leave today so that we kind of have an accurate understanding as we go into the week as to what we have and what we might need. Uh, and then make plans to join us. Put in your calendar uh, so that you know that uh, uh, next Sunday after the service we're going to be having lunch together. Um, two, and there is also a sign-up sheet for, uh, for this. This is new this week. We are going to be offering, again, uh, um, uh, AED and CPR training. We did this a couple years ago. Uh, this is not for medical professionals, but it is for uh, uh, lay people, I guess, if you might you know, put it that way, um, for, uh, to know basic, basic, basic life-saving skills, basic CPR, uh, how to use the AED, which is in the, uh, uh, in the building, in case someone were to have uh, a cardiac uh, emergency, and you were the person who was, uh, who was here. Uh, it, the training is really good. The trainers are excellent, um, and it will be held... Uh, at the uh, at the the end of November, uh, November 29th, Wednesday evening, at seven o'clock, there's a sign-up sheet, uh, and we do we, we do need to have a rough idea of how many people to expect uh, to have here, just so that they have the appropriate materials and stuff in in place. So sign up for that, um, and uh, and make plans to be here uh, for that. Uh, third thing, just to save the uh, save the date, the Christmas Carol sing. Uh, December the 3rd. Now I'm skipping over stuff. There's stuff for Thanksgiving. I understand that, but I uh, want to make sure you have on your calendar uh, the Christmas carol sing uh, December 3rd, 6.30. That's a Sunday night uh, here in the, uh, in the sanctuary here at, uh, at, at Calvary. Uh, so those are just a couple of things. There's other things in the uh, announcement list. Uh, let me point out to you uh, something that's in your bulletin, right? Was this in everybody's uh, bulletin today? This little insert uh, about the Reformation. Now, um, on October 31st, uh, as a culture celebrates Halloween, uh, the church in church history uh, commemorates an event that happened on October 31st, 1517, and that was when uh, a, a monk by the name of Martin Luther uh, nailed 95 grievances, 95 theses, uh, to a building in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, that he kind of said, look, th these are things that are going on in the church and they need to be reformed. And that ignited a reform movement that brought the, uh, the church back to its historic teaching of, uh, of the Bible and what the Bible teaches. And it is frequently summarized um, what, the, what the church did in recovering its understanding of the true uh, teaching of the Bible. It's frequently summarized in what are referred to as five solas, sola uh, meaning alone or by itself. And so what the church uh, recovered was this understanding that our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, as revealed to us in the Bible alone, all for the glory of God alone. The five solas. Now what this, uh, this, uh, this year's little insert will talk more in depth about is by grace alone. It is by grace you have been saved. And so we are saved by grace alone, which means it is nothing of our work that contributes to it. It is all God's pleasure, God's work on our behalf, which is why we gather together to celebrate. Uh, we celebrate what God has done. We don't come together in a place like this on a Sunday morning to celebrate how great we are uh, or what we have done. We come to celebrate and to proclaim what God has done. And so that's, what, that's why we're here. We're a family gathered together in God's presence to celebrate his marvelous and wonderful grace. So let me invite you, encourage you to be, uh, uh, before we begin, to take a moment and silently pray. Uh, silently pray for God to be at work in your own heart. Uh, that that grace that he has shown to us would be uh, even more um, deeply pushed into your own, in your own heart. And 
because you didn't come alone this morning, that it would be more deeply pushed into the hearts of everyone around you who has come to worship as well. Let's take a moment, silently pray, and then we will begin. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, and this is what it says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, our gracious God, Lord, help us to be like trees planted by streams of living water that we would bear fruit for your kingdom. Lord, may we take delight in all of your commands, in all of your law, loving you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, all our strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, as we come to worship you this morning, may we delight in your law as we sing of its truths, as we rest in your forgiveness, and as we celebrate your grace. For we come in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first song this morning shows us this grace that we have been given, a grace that has come through the work of Jesus Christ alone. It is his work that saves us. Let's stand and let's sing together.
appropriate for us when we recognize and we celebrate God's grace to remember that what God's grace means is that we do not deserve to be in his presence except for that grace. And so it's appropriate for us to come confessing our sin, confessing those areas of our lives where we know we fall short of his standard so that we can then appreciate and celebrate his grace all the more. Now this morning for our confession of sin corporately, what I would like to do is read responsively the 51st Psalm. It is a psalm of confession, contextually in the life of the ancient King David uh, when he himself was caught in grave sin and confessed that sin to God and experienced God's forgiveness. Now we're going to do this um, reading back and forth. I will read a line and then ask you to respond uh, with a line. Uh, The words will be up on the screen behind me. If you'd like to look at it in print in front of you, uh, it's found in the red hymnals that are in the chair racks. Uh, The responsive readings are at the back of the hymnal, and it's on page 804 is where Psalm 51 is. So I will read uh, the uh, the plain-faced type and then ask you to respond uh, with the words that are in bold. Uh, Let's read this together, Psalm 51. The prayer of David, and let's make this our prayer as well. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not delight in burnt, or take, you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Let's take a moment and now let's silently pray. Ask God to forgive those areas of your life where you know you have fallen short of a standard and then we will receive and hear his assurance of pardon together. Pray silently, please. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, tells the church, you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he, that is God, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, that is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the body of a bull or a sacrifice of an, of an animal, but the body of flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, reconciled you by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is our confidence and our assurance of forgiveness. Amen. And as we strive to live lives of obedience, uh, where we seek to 
have our sinfulness led into a life of obedience and holiness. We rely upon the Holy Spirit to do it. And so let's stand and let's sing this song, this prayer to the Holy Spirit that he would be at work in us. We collect an offering in our worship service because the giving back of the things that God has given to us as an act of worship. And so we seek to celebrate that in the way that we order our worship service. Now, if you're a visitor here this morning, don't think of this in any way as a tax uh, or as a price of admission. And you are free to let the offering plate go by. You're welcome as our guest. Uh, But let's pray together and ask that God would bless these offerings for the work of his church. Father, we thank you for the privilege of participation in your work here on earth, the celebration of what you have done and proclaiming that through the work of this local congregation to the people who are here and the people in our local community. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to provide the resources through the generosity of your people uh, to do just that. May this local church be strengthened. Uh, Give us the spirit of generosity as a congregation to be able to continue supporting uh, those ministries in our community uh, that are doing this work as well, and missionaries around the world who are doing this work of proclaiming the hope that comes only through Jesus. Lord, bless us as we give and provide for our material needs, and give us a heart of gratitude and generosity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
we are commanded to come before God and to pray, and you are to do that individually in your own personal lives, um, and yet we come together as a church to do that as well. And so each week in this uh, moment of a pastoral prayer, I will lead you in corporate prayer, um, and we rotate the subjects of that, at least the primary subjects of that, between the things that we as a church are commanded to pray for. Our practice has been on the fifth Sunday of the month, when Sundays or when uh, months have five Sundays, uh, to pray for another church in our local community. Uh, we like to remind ourselves that we are not in competition uh, with those faithful churches in our neighborhood and in our community. We work alongside them to proclaim this news of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want to pray for uh, the Allenwood Church, uh, right around the corner from us, meeting at this very time, uh, on this very day, uh, worshiping the very same God. And so I want to pray for them. Uh, After I pray for the Allenwood Church, uh, uh, we will pray for our study of God's Word Uh, as we come into God's presence to study and to read uh, what He has said to us in the Scripture. We want to ask God to be at work in our hearts through that study. So let's bow together as I pray aloud. Our Father, we thank You for uh, the privilege of being able to come to You in prayer, uh, for the the command that that is, but a command because uh, You desire us to understand you better through talking to you and through making requests to you and through praising you and so lord we do pray that prayer would change us and reorient us to what it is you are doing in this world lord we thank you that we are not alone in our mission to proclaim the gospel into this community and there are several uh, local churches uh, right in this neighborhood uh, who are doing that very thing this very morning uh, proclaiming and celebrating Uh, who you are and what you've done. We pray specifically for the Allenwood Church. Uh, Lord, a church of great history uh, in this uh, this area uh, that has gone through uh, many different um, uh, forms over the the, the decades and yet, Lord, faithfully uh, meets week after week proclaiming the gospel. Uh, We pray for their continued ministry and for Pastor Dave and for his family. Would you strengthen them as Um, as they seek to serve this local congregation. Uh, We pray for Pastor Dave that you would um, give him a um, a special uh, sense of assurance of your presence this morning as he preaches your word, as he teaches uh, uh, the people that you have given him to care for. Uh, We pray for the church as they uh, seek to establish um, in the coming months uh, a process of covenant membership, something that has been uh, not uh, as prominent at the, the church in their recent history. Lord, as they seek to do that and transition towards a commitment uh, to membership in the local church, that you would bless them with a spirit of unity as they do that. Lord, keep them faithful to the gospel of Jesus. Give them boldness uh, in their vision to be uh, be one authentic family on mission. Uh, Help them to to be unified in that mission and to encourage and strengthen one another uh, as as they live in this world. We thank you, Lord, now for the study of your word that you have given us. Uh, a a recording, a record of who you are and who we are and what's gone wrong with the world and what you've done to make it right. Uh, Lord, we pray that as we study your word that we would be attentive to it, uh, that you would be able to do in our hearts what uh, what I certainly cannot do, um, and that is uh, understand exactly what people are going through, uh, know exactly what people need. Lord, only your Holy Spirit can apply perfectly uh, what we read and what I say, and so I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit uh, would be at work, that the the very living breath of your Spirit would be at work in the hearts of your people as they hear uh, your word read and taught this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to uh, to take that Bible out and turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. Four. If you don't have a Bible with you, then uh, you're welcome to use uh, one of the Bibles that are in the chair racks. Uh, uh, they're scattered around. That's the blue, uh, uh, the blue book. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 is on page 1257. Uh, the text will be up on the screen as I read it uh, in just a minute. But having it open in front of you, if you have that opportunity, gives you the ability to follow along as we're teaching. Now, just for quick context, uh, where we find ourselves in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9... Uh, You need to go back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 to see that what Paul has done now that we're in chapter 4 is he has shifted 
uh, to now reminding the church in Thessalonica about some specific issues that they need to focus on in order to, in order to please God, right? So that's the pivot, that's the topical heading of verses 1 and 2 um, as chapter 4 begins. Now last week, and specifically in verses 3 to 8, uh, they, the, the Apostle Paul was saying, hey, this is how you are to live to please God specifically in the area of sexuality, right? And he made the case for how we use our bodies in a way that God designs in a way that maximizes our pleasure and joy in this, in this world, submitting our sexuality to the Lord. Now, this week, Paul's going to shift to a different topic in verses 9 to, to 12, right? And that's how we interact with one another and how we work in the, in the world that we're living in. All right, so that's the topic this week. Now, let me, if you're able, let me ask you to stand as I read this. We do this as a, a sign of God's respect. If you're not able to stand, then of course, please stay seated. But I'm going to read this, and then because this is God's word, when I'm finished, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 9. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that, indeed, is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. Let me start again this week by talking directly to the kids. Kids, paying attention, let me talk directly to you because I want you to know that I understand how difficult it can be to be a to be a child. Right? Because parents, parents you might not know this, but but kids, I know you know this. Parents can be very confusing people. They can. They can say very confusing kinds of kinds of things. Parents, you know this is true. You know this is true. All right, kids, listen just while I talk to the parents for, for, for just a second here. For example, parents, maybe you can relate to this. Um, one of the classic contradictions of behavioral expectations happens uh, with some regularity to me. I, I, find, I find this happening to me. I catch myself into it. When it comes to the ability of children to function in the world around them, we desire them to be, parents, you know this is true, simultaneously loving, empathetic, community-oriented, outward-focused, right? We do, right? And we want them to be that, but we also want them to be self-reliant, hardworking, and independent, on the other hand, right? Outward-focused, community-oriented, self-reliant, self-dependent. And so if you're an adult, you can appreciate the need for both of these characteristics. But if you're a child, children, right? you can see how sometimes your parents' instructions to you can lead to serious confusion. This is what I mean, kids. As, tell me if this has ever happened to you. Because in only a matter of minutes, I have found myself at different points in my uh, parental journey thus far, saying to my children something like this. I'll say, look, you know we exist as a family here, okay? It's not just you. You're not just the only person here in this house. So how about we start looking out for other people and not just looking out for yourself, okay? Instead of just worrying about yourself, why don't you look around and help someone? Get it? Kids, have you ever heard parents say something like that? Right? Parents, that's good, right? Good stuff. Helpful, important kind of things, right? Now then, listen though, this is what I would do. Same child. I'll say, sometimes just a few minutes later, when they attempt in their own way to help others who may not want help and screaming ensues, Right? I will say, excuse me, is that your business? No, it's not. Please just worry about yourself. Just worry about you. Don't worry about what they're doing. Don't worry about that. You worry about you. Got it? Is it any wonder that being a kid can be confusing? Right? And any reason, <laughs> and is it any wonder that in Ephesians 5, Paul tells fathers not to exasperate their children, right? Now, that may not happen in anyone else's home. Right, but please play for my children because they have to live with me. Now, I share this because I think that's sort of how you might feel when you read these verses here in 1 Thessalonians 4. Because in 9 and 10, we seem to hear Paul making the case for radical community with others. Love other people, right? You aren't just the only person here. You need to look out for other people. He's making a case for mutual dependence among the people of God. Right? Then, verses 11 to 12, it sounds like he tells them they should be minding their own business that they should do their best not to be dependent, he makes a case for independence. So which is it? Dependence or independence? 
Ah, spoiler alert, the answer, of course, is, is both. But the question right, the, the, that we need to look at is why and how. If he's saying both of these things, how do they fit together? Because there is a great potential for confusion here in these verses. And these verses have been, particularly 11 and 12, have been sometimes misunderstood as to what they mean and why Paul's saying what he's saying. Right? So what I want to look at, and there's a kind of rough outline that you can follow along in the, uh, in the bulletin, though you don't really need you need it written down to follow it, right? But I want to talk about the need for dependence on the one hand, and that's primarily verses 9 and 10. And then I want to talk about the need for independence, and that's primarily verses 11 and 12. And then we need to think about, okay, what brings them together? How do the two really work together um, and both be true at the same time? All right, first, let's look at the need for dependence, right? Just to reorient ourselves, look at verses 9 and 10. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Now, this is fairly straightforward, right? What's Paul urging them to, to do? To love one another, right? And what kind of, what kind of love? Brotherly love, right? That's the, 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 that, the Greek word here, translated brotherly love. It's the Greek word philia. Right now, in, in the northeast part of the United States, right, this is actually a pretty familiar term because it's where the city Philadelphia gets its name. Now, some might debate whether it's true of the people who live in the city of Philadelphia, but it is called, at least, the city of brotherly love, and that's the reason, because that's what the word Philadelphia means. Now, in contrast, there are other Greek words for, for love, but in contrast to the other Greek words for, for love, brotherly love is not the romantic love between a, a husband and a wife. It's not the, the predetermined sort of instinctual natural love that a mother has for a, a, for a child. It's the love of friendship. It's a close bond, a bond like, uh, like brothers based on, on shared interests, on shared tasks, on shared affinity. Now, outside of the Bible, in other Greek writing, it's a word that refers to the affection that, that happens between people when they live, you know, when they're, when they're part of a certain group, when they belong together, right? You're a clique, you're, you're, you're a crew, right? That's what, that's what it refers to. When the, when the New Testament uses the term, it's specifically taking that term and using the concept to talk about how Christians ought to love one another, fellow, fellow believers, right? So Paul is urging the Christians in Thessalonica to continue loving each other. Now, to some, that might sound, you know, ex exclusive. Oh, sure, just love the Christians, right? But, but you need to understand that that statement for the church to love everyone within the church, you need to understand how radically inclusive that kind of love really was. In other words, defining brotherly love in this way completely would have gone against the social expectations about which people you were supposed to love and affiliate with. Because the cultural expectation of the time, right, was that your friends, your, your, your crew, it was defined by your, by your social status, it was defined by your class, it was defined by, by what schools you went to, or it was defined maybe by your, by your race or the language you speak or where you came from. Those were the things that defined the, the people that you were to show brotherly love to. And then comes along the Christian church and says that God defines brotherly love differently because it says that your friends are not determined by your social status, by your class, by your race, by your, by your language. The church was open to people of all social classes, all ethnic backgrounds. And that was very, very different. Right? Christianity is distinctive because it upends the social convention of who we love. It tears down the barriers that exist between people groups in the, in the world with a message of of reconciliation. Now, reconciliation first with God, that's the primary relationship that has been broken because of our sin. But that, that reconciliation between us and God is what becomes the basis for our reconciliation with other people. In other places, Paul uses the language of, of adoption, and that's a really good metaphor. When someone believes the gospel, when they come into the, into the church, they are adopted into a new family with God as the heavenly father. And when that happens, we get new siblings. Right? That's the gospel. The older brother Jesus has ushered us into a new family. Now, this isn't to say that the church always lives up to <laughs> the urging of Paul here. But the Thessalonians, it seems the Thessalonians, they were doing a pretty good job of it. It seems, right? They were caring for each other locally. They were even, verse 10, uh, caring for others throughout the region. You go back, Paul talked about that earlier in the letter, how they were doing that. So the Thessalonians, they seem to be doing an okay job with it. Sadly, churches, though, a lot of churches do fail up uh, failed to live up to this, this standard, right? And some of you might have stories in your own past where you've, you've experienced something like that. But when it happens, when it actually does work the way that it's supposed to work, when Christians do 
love one another in, a, um, in, in the appropriate way. It is a powerful thing. I, I read um, about a pastor's wife describing how one Thanksgiving, uh, she hosted 27 people for dinner in their, in their modest home. 27 people. And it took reconfiguring kind of the home with, you know, rooms and tables. And, but they had such a good time doing it that they decided to sort of just, like, let's just leave the house this way. We'll just leave it like this. It kind of worked, right? So they, they transitioned into like, you know, we're just going to do this on a, on a regular basis. So it became a regular event for them to have all kinds of people over for a large family dinner, you know, oftentimes on, you know, on Sunday afternoons. And one of the regulars uh, at, at, these, at these dinners uh, years ago uh, was a guy named Zion. Now, Zion wasn't able to be there every week when they, ha- when they had the dinner, and that's because Zion was finishing the last two years of a 10-year jail sentence. And he was only allowed outside the prison walls with, clu- with close supervision for five hours every other week. Right? So, so what he would do is he would come to church and then he would join this brotherly dinner a couple times a month. Now, think about how radically inclusive that Philadelphia-style love must seem to a guy like Zion. Right? One week when he was first um, starting to come, Zion was unusually quiet and, and tears started to come to his eyes as the potatoes were being passed. And it wasn't because, like, I hate potatoes. This is so terrible. Like, you know. No. But he looked at his host as the potatoes were being passed. And he said, you know, I have never been in a home like this before. I, I mean, it's been a very long time. He said, no, actually never. I have never. I've never been in a home not like this with love, with Christ, with brothers and sisters, with children. And I belong here. That's what he said. Do you hear the amazement in a statement like that? The table of love is a table where he has a seat. He belongs at that table. It's amazing. It's pretty radical, right? We belong to each other. Pastors, wives, and convicts, go figure, and everything in between. Now, that's the need for dependence. Now, verses 11 and 12, the need for independence. Let's read those verses again. Again, Paul says, we urge you more and more, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Okay, so first, what's he saying? Like just on the face of it. Well, at the very least, before we, before we do anything to try to reconcile this with what he just said, we should see very clearly that um, he's saying able Christians, Christians who are able to work, that they should work that they should earn their own living, that they should avoid unnecessarily depending upon others to provide for their, their basic needs. At the very least, that's what he's saying. And what he's trying to combat in saying this is the concept of idleness, being idle, right? In his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul actually makes a comment that elaborates a little bit more on, on, on this idea because 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, all right, if you're in 1 Thessalonians, you can get there pretty quickly because 2 Thessalonians follows 1 Thessalonians. So you can turn there if you want. Look at verse 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. Paul says, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Right? Verse 11, 2 Thessalonians 3. We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Okay, in other words, what he's saying is troublemakers need to get a job, right? Do something useful that will occupy your time. Now, contextually, there are two possible reasons why Paul might be encouraging people, specifically in Thessalonica, to get a job and start working. Now, first, and as we keep reading, we'll see this next week, as you keep going in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you'll see that there was at least some theological confusion and some theological misunderstanding in this church specifically that needed to be corrected among the Thessalonians. Right? Because some bad theology was leading to some bad practice. And we'll see next week that at least some of the people in Thessalonica had taken Jesus' teaching that, that, that he wanted them to be watching for his return. They had taken that so literally that they were just sitting around like sipping a cold beverage and like watching the sky. Wonder when. Maybe next hour. Right? I'm not going to do anything. Because you know, who knows, it could be, right? They were taking that to that kind of extreme. Now whether this was on their part an excuse to get out of work or they were sincerely just mistaken, one way or the other, it doesn't really matter, the encouragement to Paul, the, the encouragement that Paul is making to them is the same. He's saying, look, get up, take the umbrella, the little umbrella out of your lemonade and get to work. 
Because Jesus said that we should be watchful for his return, and he told us to be prepared for his return, but he told us that we wouldn't know when it was going to be, and that the right way to be prepared and to be watchful for his return is to be actively doing the work that he's called you to do in the meantime, not passively waiting. Now, we'll talk more about that in the next couple of weeks. But some people believe that that's probably the main reason why Paul is emphasizing this here, not to be idle, to get to, get to work, to take care of yourself, to meet, your own, to meet your own needs and not depend upon others. Right? That's, that's why some people think. Now, other people, other possibility favored by some other scholars is that Paul is really talking about here, what he's really taking on is the Roman system of patronage. The Roman system of patronage. Now, we don't have it a super close approximation in our world today to what this would have looked like. But in the Greco-Roman culture of Paul's day, a culture that Thessalonica would have been right in the middle of, this is what would happen. You'd have a really wealthy person, a patron, who would give financial support, would give opportunities to men of lesser uh, lesser standing, lesser, so, lesser social standing. That would be the clients. So you'd have a patron and you'd have a client. And these clients, right, for their part, and, and in return for the, the patronage that's offered, the support that was offered, what they would do is they would, they would then show, uh, show service, show respect, loyalty to the, to the patron. And it took several forms, right? For example, and this is probably the closest to how we might still use the word patron a little bit in our in our culture today, right? Sometimes when it came to the arts, you would have a a patron who would employ someone to to be their client and it kind of worked like uh, like that. An artist would be would be sponsored. He would be cared for by a by a wealthy patron, and in um, and in return for his material needs being met, this person would uh, uh, produce works of uh, musical composition or uh, paintings or, or sculptures or, or things like that. Now, truthfully, that's really just an economic arrangement. I mean, it's kind of the way the culture worked at the time, but that's an economic arrangement, sort of the same as a wealthy person, you know, hiring an, an artist in residence or, uh, you know, or supporting some sort of scholarship so that someone can uh, produce works of, of culture or art, right? That, that was this, this it could have worked like that. Now, sometimes though, in the Greco-Roman world, the system of patronage took on a, a little bit more calculating kind of a, of, a, of a flavor. Sometimes it was more social, more political, and this is really where Paul would have had the problem. And this is where, where people kind of say, like, no, you need to work for yourself. This is why Paul might have said that, they say. Because a patron sometimes would collect people, especially valuable if they were Roman citizens. He would collect them, and he would basically pay for their needs. Let me take care of you. All right, let, let, me, let me buy you this. Don't worry about that. I'll take, I'll take care of it. And he would sort of collect favors. Right? And, and so they wouldn't have to work. But in return, they would be expected to support the social and the political interests of the the patron uh, whenever it was needed, right, in the assembly or in public debates. You know, so and say, hey, when people start talking about this, you're with me, right, because we have an arrangement. Now, this is where Paul would, would have had a problem. Right, and Paul would be saying here that Christians should avoid any situation where they might be tempted to act against their conscience because of an inappropriate, dependent relationship upon a patron. Right, that would be a second possibility for why Paul is emphasizing the need for independence here. Right, the need to work and support oneself, to take care of one's needs so that they would not be bought by some political patron, right? But I think we can say, more generally, regardless of which particular view you think Paul was specifically zeroing in on, and there might be an element of both perhaps, but we can say that Paul very much believed that it was contrary to our human nature, to to the design that God has made for us to sit around and just do nothing when we could instead be working. And that's where this gets really radical again. Right, we talked about the radical aspect of community, right? People loving one another that's, that were different than them, right? Radical, radical dependence. Here we get into an area that's radical again because what Paul is saying is, is part of a larger Christian understanding about the very nature of what work is. And that was very different from the understanding of work at the, at the time, right? You see this when Paul tells them that they should work with their hands, Right now, he's not saying that only manual labor is, is worthy work, but he is, in a very radical, very countercultural way, again, dignifying manual work. L- work with your, with your hands. And this is a very clear jab, a very clear attack on Greco-Roman culture, right? which believed that there were levels of dignity to work. And this is true throughout the ancient world. Right? There were h- higher levels of work, Works of the mind, works of philosophy, works of art, right? These were the works of the aristocracy. Then there was the physical work, 
right, the work for the lower classes, the work for the slaves as it kind of went down the, the hierarchy. And that distinction between dignified mind work and undignified hand work was pretty much the view of the, of the culture of the time. It was almost universal in the ancient world. Right? Because they viewed the material as actually less important than the intellectual and the spiritual. The material may be necessary, but it is a, of a lower spot on the hierarchy of importance. But of course, a biblical Christian worldview, a biblical understanding of the world, doesn't allow you to do that. It doesn't drive a wedge between, between the, 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 the work of the mind and the work of the hands. Right? Just think about God himself. Right? When God created Adam, go back to the Genesis account, Genesis 1 and 2. When God created Adam as a perfect image bearer of who he was, how did he do it? From the dust of the ground. In, you know, in, in a very figurative kind of sense, you know, Adam was created out of the, out of the dirt, out of, out of matter, out of the physicalness. You could, you could think about it in, in, a, in a metaphorical way. God doesn't have physical hands, but, but God got, got dirt under his fingernails as he created Adam. Right? It, wasn't, it wasn't punishment, it wasn't unfortunate um, consequence like other religions uh, would believe that humanity was created with physical bodies. It was intentional. We're physical beings. It's good. That's how God created it. Or, or think about Paul, Paul himself. Paul was a, it was a tent maker. That was his, that was his profession. He, 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 he made tents. He constructed tents. He got his hands dirty. Think of Jesus. Right? Jesus himself almost certainly as a younger man, would have apprenticed with his adoptive father, Joseph, as a, as a carpenter in manual work, right? He would have gotten his hands dirty. This is really important to emphasize, I think, in our current culture, specifically, every generation needs to communicate this to the, to the next generation, right? I'm not trying to be a cranky old guy, but right, I talk to a lot of business owners who kind of say, hey, look, one of the things we struggle with in our world is helping young people understand, as I hire them into my business, helping young people understand the value of doing hard material hand work right you see it in i mean just the, it, the statistics about teenage employment right uh, employment rates for teens and students continues to remain very low in america related to historical standards and of course the reasons can be complex for that personal reasons economic reasons i get that but the reality is that most of those 16 17 18 19 year old kind of jobs right they're manual labor jobs they're greasy jobs Right? And even if one doesn't end up doing you know, the greasy manual hand labor kind of work for, for a career, there is significant benefit in understanding the dignity of work like that. Because if you aren't careful, then you can begin to become a culture and have a mindset that falls into the same trap as the ancient Greeks and Romans, thinking that work with your hands is somehow beneath us. It's not. Right? If you were to think of it, one kind of catch takeaway phrase, all, all honest work done in God's world is dignified work. Right? All honest work done in God's world is dignified work. A few years ago, I was flying home from, um, from our denomination's General Assembly, and I was sitting next to an airline pilot. Uh, he, he um, I wasn't in the cockpit. <laughs> he, um, he, um, he, he, lives, he lives in Atlanta, and he was flying from Atlanta to Philadelphia so that he could then fly another plane back to Atlanta. Right? Sometimes they have to do that. They try to maximize so that they don't, you know, have kind of empty, you know, non-productive flights, but sometimes they have to do that. There was a plane in Philadelphia that needed a pilot back, and so they were flying him to Philadelphia, and then he was going to return, right? So we got talking, and it turns out uh, that this guy, he attended a church off and on throughout the, the years, and as we talked, he actually had a right understanding about who Jesus was, about how someone came to, to know God and, was, and became a, got into a relationship with God. But most of his questions as we talked, the questions that he really wrestled with were questions about work about where what he did fit into uh, the biblical storyline. And he, he liked flying planes. He was good at flying planes. But he was wondering, and he kind of asked me, he's like, maybe, ah, maybe it's not really good work. Maybe, there, maybe there's something, um, something better, something more Christian, he said, that I should be doing. Now, you might expect, talking to a, a Christian minister sitting next to him on the plane, someone who actually, who did leave a corporate job to go and, and become a pastor, you might think that I would immediately begin, you know, encouraging him. Could, yeah, maybe, you, yeah, I think you should, right? I, you know, leave, leave the, you know, uh, leave Delta Airlines and, and, uh, and, and you, should, you should go to seminary, right? And there's lots of guys I would do that with if they got to know him. Maybe that is the right thing for, for some people and I've had that kind of conversation with people, but that wasn't his issue. Right? From what I could tell in, in talking to him, this Delta Airlines pilot, what he needed to hear was that what he was doing every day was in fact perhaps the most spiritual, the most Christian work that he could be doing. 
right? Because all honest work done in God's world is dignified work, right? Think about it from his perspective, from the perspective of an airline pilot, right? What this man did, working with his hands to, you know, flip switches and turn dials, hopefully in the right order, in the right direction, right? What he did with all those levers and dials and buttons, in a way, it was incredibly useful in God's world because he was enabling hundreds of people every single day to travel safely hundreds of miles in mere hours, all right, so we talked about this, and I said, like, look, think about this. Every day, passengers on your plane almost certainly include people like this. They most certainly include anxious patients who are traveling somewhere to a hospital to get life-saving treatment. Almost every day, there are people on this plane who are brave soldiers traveling to assignments to better protect our country. Right? There are hardworking business people meeting clients so that our economy can function to bring food to our tables. Every day on these planes, there are probably grieving young people traveling to the funeral of grandparents in another city. Happy families enjoying vacations that are, uh, that are mixed in with, with all of that. Christian pastors like me who are traveling to conferences or to assemblies to learn better how to minister the gospel of Jesus to people. All of those things are happening and you in your work are enabling it to happen. Look, Maybe God is calling you into full-time Christian ministry. And I'd love to help people discern that, right? That the church needs that. But if he's not doing that, right, then he's not asking you to settle for some lesser level of, of work. Don't ever think that whatever your version of flying the plane is, is somehow less dignified. All honest work done in God's world is dignified work because it contributes to society, because it frees you from being a burden on others. It's a very loving thing to do. In the very best sense, it's the independence that Paul says that we need. And when that sinks in, when you better appreciate your place in God's economy, then you can understand the quiet life that he's talking about in verse 11. Do you see that phrase? Right? We need to understand this term, living quietly. Right? Living quietly. That's not sitting lemonade on the deck of some cottage by the beach or a dock at the lake. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but this term, living quietly, it's, it describes people who are content, who are productive contributors to their community. They're quiet in the sense that they don't cause trouble. All right, they're good neighbors. You want them on your, your block. And this is where we begin to see things coming together, right? We need dependence, brotherly love, community, compassion for others. But we also need independence, dignified work that seeks to glorify God and meet our needs, right? We, this is what bring them, brings them together. The fact that while you need both true dependence, love, and true independence, work, you can't really have one without the other. Think about this. You can't really, you can't have true love without work. You can't. All right, you see, if you desire community and you desire connection with other people, but you aren't willing to give something of yourself for that relationship, for it to occur, then you don't really have love for other people. All right, you want community so that other people can meet your needs, can serve you, but you don't really love others, right? You only love yourself. If you want community without the, without the willingness to contribute to it, without the willingness to work, to take your part in it, then it's not really about community with others that you're interested in. It's really more about serving yourself. You can't have true love without work. But neither, on the other side, can you, have, can you truly work without love. Not truly, not in the way that it was intended to, right? I mean, you can be, you can be economically self-sufficient. You can pay all your bills. You can fully fund your retirement. You can properly insure yourself and protect yourself from financial risk. But ultimately, if all that work isn't done for some higher purpose, something outside of yourself, some motivation of love, then what have you really gained? Right? Your work was made for more than that. It was made so that it can benefit some higher purpose outside of yourself, so that it can benefit others. So do you see right? You can't have community unless you're willing to work for it, and you can't really work unless you're doing it for some higher motivation of love and, and community with others, right? True love works, and true work loves. Now, that's what brings the two concepts together, right? The mutual necessity of both, the fact that you can't really have one, one without the other, but nowhere do you see that more clearly, this coming together, of true love that works and true work that loves, nowhere do you see that more clearly than in the life and the work of Jesus because no one more perfectly brings dependence and independence, love and work. No one more perfectly brings those two things together than Jesus because he, know, he knows what perfect community feels like. Right? He was one of three persons in the Godhead, mutual love, community, that predates the creation of humanity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, loving one another and perfectly community. He knows what that feels like, right? But he left that so that we could experience some of it too. 
Jesus, in his human nature, he also knows what it's like to love like a brother, right? He chose to share his life with other people, other disciples. He asked them to pray for them. They ate together, right? And that love that he showed to them and taught them to experience, that love is the greatest work that the world has ever known, right? This is what I mean. Well, I might sound frustratingly contradictory to my kids, right? When I say to my children that they need to think of others and not just themselves, right? It's not because independence is wrong it's because they're doing independence wrongly in other words if you think that independence just means that other people should serve you then you don't understand independence and on the other hand when i say to my children that they need to back off and not worry about the business of others it's not because depending on others is wrong it's because they're doing dependence on others wrongly they're seeking to serve themselves rather than to uh, to, to serve other people right here's the convicting thing though the thing that all of us need to understand right it, it, it might have every reason to frustrate my children, but here's the thing. I'm really just like them, and so are you. We're just like them. We do neither work nor love correctly, and in that failure to do that, we rebel against God. The, the God who gives us both work and love, we rebel against that. We think that community exists for our benefit, and we think that work entitles us to call the shots and to do whatever we feel like, and the Bible calls both of those things, both of those extremes and misunderstandings, calls both of them sin saying to god that we think that we will be better at ruling our lives rather than him and what sin does simultaneously is disconnect us from community community with god but as a result we can't have the dependence the community with other people that we need because of sin and it incurs a debt so large that no amount of work on our part no matter how hard we work could ever repay all the independence in the world all the hard working independent nature that we might muster cannot do for us what we need and that is to erase the penalty that is due us for that sin and that's why G what jesus did on the cross the work that he did is so absolutely remarkable because on the cross you have a love that is working a love in action and you have a work that is loving Right? You can always tell someone that works with their hands, can't you? You encounter someone that works with their hands, you know it. My Little League baseball coach when I was 10, 11, and 12 was a contractor, Mr. Condell, one of the gentlest, kindest men I knew. But man, did he have rough hands. I mean, calloused hands, scraped hands, scarred hands. He was a contractor, he worked with his hands. And you could tell that he worked with his hands when you looked at his hands. When Thomas the disciple needed proof that Jesus had done his work, that it had been accomplished, what did he ask to see? His hands. He said, I need to see the hands. Have you seen Jesus' hands? Have you seen them? They pounded nails through those hands so that he could accomplish in his work the greatest, most loving thing that the world has ever known. Right? They are the evidence, his hands that he voluntarily experienced disconnection from community with the Father so that, he wouldn't ha so that we wouldn't have to experience a, a lack of community with the Father, right? His hands are the evidence that the debt that we incurred are paid, that that debt is paid. They're evidence that the work has been done and that it has been done for us in love. Everything that Paul is urging the Thessalonians to do here is impossible without Jesus having done it first. True love works and true work loves. Paul is not making contradictory statements here. Now, you may find the instructions of Paul baffling. You might find them exasperating. But if you do, if you don't understand that connection, then you will constantly bounce back and forth between those two extremes. Right? Wanting to love without a willingness to put into, into community the kind of work that's necessary to make it happen. Right? Wanting to work, but really only to meet your needs and not the needs of, of others or something greater. And the only way to stop bouncing between those extremes is to put your faith in the only one, Jesus, who has been perfectly able to do both. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done, for the work that you have done, the work that you have accomplished on our behalf and for our good. Thank you, Lord, that your love did not stay inactive, but it worked for us. And thank you that your work was not futile or in vain, but that it was accomplished uh, for a purpose and a purpose of love. So Lord, let us rest in that work that you have done for us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are able to work because Jesus has worked for us and his work of atoning for our sin was finished. It was completed on the cross. Let's stand this last song and sing together. It was finished upon that cross.
eyes towards heaven and receive God's blessing as you go. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Thank you.